Thanks for having me here. It's good to be back in the networking uh, optimization crowd. We will talk about some of the network optimization work. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to give a talk about network optimization in search uh, via consistent hashing and balanced partitioning. Before going through the talk and the topics, I wanted to uh, give you a sense of uh, what do I, I do at Google and like um, what's, uh, what do we do in uh, like our group uh, in the research team in New York. So we have a, a small um, research team for doing algorithm research in the Google New York team. Like, uh, so the Google research team in New York has several machine learning, data mining, NLP uh, the groups, and we have you know, like in the order of 15 people in algorithms. So most of our activities have been uh, in ads optimization and uh, online advertising, mechanism design, and online optimization. We also have a big uh, large scale graph algorithm library for the rest of Google where we provide these type of tools for uh, other uh, teams. So these are like basically algorithms research in the field, different type. Very recently, basically uh, the last mm, one and a half years, we have started working on some infrastructure uh, optimization problems uh, for some projects at Google. And I'm going to tell you, try to tell you two, three stories about what we have done uh, for network optimization in the recent years. Uh, so I used to do more of network, uh, network research and network optimization 10 years ago for my PhD and, and so on. The one reason that I moved uh, like more to data mining type uh, research and uh, maybe ads optimization research uh, was that it was hard to deploy like these ideas or algorithms with the, that we develop in network networking uh, in like real systems. At Google also, uh, most of the like infrastructure optimization and networking problems are more risk system oriented. It's, it's not as easy to find like interesting optimization problems there. But as I said, in the past one and a half years, we have managed to create some channels to working with engineering teams. I'm going to tell you about like two uh, or maybe possibly three problems that we have done uh, in the past one and a half year. So the first story is about consistent hashing for uh, like uh, load balancing in <coughs> dynamic environments. This is a joint work with Mikhail Torop, who visited us, and Morteza, who is another member in our team. So the problem, uh, this story is very short and very concise. The problem here is uh, we have a set of clients we call balls, and we want to hash to a set of bins, servers. We want to uh, allocate uh, 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 balls into bins or uh, clients into servers in a dynamic environment uh, where both bins and balls can uh, be added or removed in the system. So we are dealing with a dynamic environment like this. We want to come up with a good hashing scheme that uh, would decide it, uh, like where each ball ends up. So definitely we want to achieve good load balancing. So we want to make sure that no one bin gets like too many uh, balls. And uh, we are in a dynamic environment. Whenever a bin uh, fails or a ball is removed or added, uh, we may want to recompute and reallocate uh, the, like, the balls that are not allocated anymore. So we want to make sure that upon any change in the system, when we remove or add a ball or a bin, the number of movements in the system or changes in the system is also minimized. So that's what, we, what I call uh, ha and hashing in the dynamic environment. So the update time of the time it takes to update doesn't matter. What matters here in our setting, the fact that we have to move the, like for example, information of one client from one server to another server. Uh, the number of clients that change their allocation is uh, like critical. We want to minimize that. And like we want to have a memory-less system that can be computed in a distributed manner without state from scratch. So you have heard of these type of problems. Uh, the method of choice here would be consistent hashing or uh, like in a distributed environment code. You can hash balls and beans into a circle. Uh, 
even in a distributed manner, and then put each ball uh, in the next available bin. That's what I call consistency hashing, and you've heard, uh, you've seen this. If you are in a static environment, you can also do something better. You can do power of two, two choices. You can try to allocate the ball to two random bins and take the minimum uh, like load bin, loaded bin. So if I want to summarize the state of the art for these problems, when you use consistency hashing or core type techniques, the maximum load on a bin could be much higher than the uh, like the optimum that you could have achieved if you didn't have like uh, these dynamic or like uh, if you were to allocate the optimum solution. So like you may go beyond the optimum uh, density by log n factor and that's not acceptable. So congestion is very bad in these environments. But in terms of relocation, corridor consistency hashing is optimal. You basically only move balls as you really need to. Like, so like when a bin fails, or like is removed, you only reallocate the balls allocated to that bin. So that's very good. If you do a, basically, uh, if you apply cuckoo hashing or different type of balance allocation, power of two choice allocation, you can gain in the maximum load. You can go from log n to log log n, uh, but you still have a super constant uh, increase in the load. And they, these type of techniques don't work easily uh, uh, like in a dynamic environment. So you have to recompute and uh, with recomputation, um, like, uh, uh, like um, you have to like, this, uh, like implement a non-trivial system. There is another technique that's known as linear probing with tight capacity. So uh, the, the technique there is you allocate balls into a bin you know, in a circle uh, like at random, then if the bin is full, you probe to the next one, and so on and so forth. So this way you can achieve the best density, you can achieve the best allocation, uh, basically, but then um, the, the best load balancing. But uh, in terms of number of movements that you get, like when you, uh, when you remove a bin, uh, it may be arbitrarily bad, actually. So the technique that we develop here and we propose we first run simulations and I'll tell you the theoretical results we have is what we call linear, linear probing with one plus epsilon extra uh, multiplicative capacity. So we say co compute the optimum uh, load balancing factor here. This is density and we multiply that by, by one plus epsilon. Then we do linear uh, probing with this capacity constraint. We say go to the first bin uh, uh, that like on the circle that uh, your uh, random hash function tells you. And then uh, if it's the capacity of that bin is um, the, uh, like um, above this uh, capacity, then try the next one. Try next one and next one until you get to the point that the capacity constraint is satisfied. Then uh, like you allocate to that. So what we can prove is that for uh, a big uh, like um, most epsilon that we care about, and I'll tell you the theoretical result in the next, next slide, the number of movements that you have to do per each ball that you have to really move, you, have to, you will end up moving at most one over epsilon square uh, like balls. So it's a very clean uh, model, uh, like a clean algorithm. Uh, so I have to emphasize on one thing, um, that basically when I apply this linear probing, I look at the current number of bins, uh, balls. Uh, I assume that they are uh, ordered from one to M. So when I remove a ball, I only remove the last ball. And uh, basically I allocate uh, uh, based on this scheme from ball number one to ball number two, ball number three in that order. And when I follow this uh, uh, scheme, each ball will go to a bin, I'm guaranteed to have this much uh, load balancing, and the question is how much um, uh, I'm going to lose in terms of a number of movements, and we can bound it by this. If I want to tell you, so now if there was a question. Oh yeah, just, yeah. Uh, on that previous chart, uh, there's another strategy, just like consistent hashing, but you make login instances of each bin. Good, yeah, that's what is called virtual bins yeah. in the consistent hashing. But doesn't that bring it down to just density? No. 
that's not so we have we should have a long conversation <laughs> about that so like there is uh, in in court paper or in, in like this paper consistent hashing paper are you part of that paper <laughs> No, <laughs> like not that. So there is actually, <laughs> yeah, there is a paragraph that's a bit misleading. Uh, and yeah, in our archive version, I'm like basically uh, debating with Mikkel how to write that in a polite manner. <laughs> like, <laughs> so. Give it to me raw. Yeah, yeah. So basically, the problem is uh, you don't achieve this at all. Uh, you, you don't even achieve a constant factor. Uh, like, so the problem. Um, yeah. So, like, we can t take it offline. Take it offline. Yeah. But did they mention that in the consistent hashing paper. They they claim that okay, you do like if you look at uh, log n virtual beans, then you can take this down something, but it's vague. Let's put it that way. <laughs> so, uh, so what do we achieve uh, like more rigorously in terms of uniformity? We achieve exactly one plus epsilon times the average load, so it's our choice. What is the load that we want to go after? We can uh, like go after hard capacity even. And in terms of how uh, the number of movements, if epsilon is less than one, we get one over epsilon square per ball operation that we need to do. If epsilon is greater than one, we get much better uh, performance. We get this many movements, one plus, or the log of one plus epsilon over epsilon square. The interesting thing about this part is that uh, the, the bound goes to the like zero or li little of one as epsilon uh, increases. So basically, uh, we are saying that for epsilon greater than one, the extra location disappears in the limit, and that's interesting. Um, so, okay, so we have done several uh, like. Uh, simulations and like different type of scenarios. And we have deployed this in one of the systems, but I haven't got, uh, received approval to tell you about uh, that part, but it doesn't matter. The message of the first part, the take home point for the first part is that when you want to achieve a desirable load balancing in a dynamic environment, try linear probing with one plus epsilon extra multiplicative capacity. The good news is that we have both good theoretical bounds and empirical properties for this, and you can deploy it easily in a system. Message one, done. Message two, uh, so we have recently applied um, like some, so this part, the second part, doesn't have as much theory. It's like a nice applied algorithm story. Uh, so it's a combina uh, like a joint work with the back end of search uh, team, uh, uh, like a search team in New York and our team. So. What's balanced graph partitioning? First of all, it's a very hard problem that many of us know. You want, you're given an edge-weighted, node-weighted graph. You want to divide it into almost equal pieces and minimize the interaction, uh, like minimize the cut. So almost equal pieces maybe in terms of the number of nodes or the total weight of nodes. It's a very hard problem to solve. So uh, like after I tell you the motivation, I'll tell you we have developed a good, uh, like, an empirical algorithm, uh, distributed algorithm that solves it for any graph. You give me billions of nodes, uh, like tens of billions of edges, hundreds of billions of edges. We can manage to find a good solution. We compare with the state of art in terms of applied algorithm and data sets, and we know it's good. And we manage to apply it on some uh, like uh, search application. So let me tell you about the search application first. So this is the part that I did get approval to tell you. Uh, so. Um, so as I said at the very beginning, for the system infrastructure, it's harder to get up, yeah, like, um, to tell you the details. But I then, uh, like the motivation comes from caching, where uh, if you uh, basically have a query stream, if you manage to uh, cache like, queries that are similar in the same server, you can uh, have a big advantage in terms of uh, cache misses. So uh, like if you're talking about the back end of search, like the query arrives, you get to a root. There are several replicas that uh, the same data lives in. And uh, the query has to be sent to uh, like uh, one of these. So we can do it either at random, or we can do a pre-specified pre lookup table like that says, OK, all the queries that are related to something similar, 
go to the same type of replica. So, so we have maybe some uh, access to some uh, terms in search that, okay, these terms appear together in queries, and maybe we want to like uh, go after three replicas. Uh, so we divide the terms into three pieces, and then when a query arrives, uh, so we uh, do this offline analysis, we you know, like uh, store this lookup table in the root, and whenever a query arrives, we just know where to send it based on the terms in that query. So that's the type of idea. So if I want, so this is the algorithm. We have to do balance partitioning on the terms offline, and then online we have to uh, build a lookup table based on that balance partitioning, and do a um, uh, basically uh, like route those queries to the ones uh, in the corresponding partition. So if I want to give you more intuitive description, so we have queries. Uh, they have different type of terms. So we can build a graph out of this. We have to make sure that the terms that we want to, the queries that we send to each of uh, these shards are balanced, because there is a load balancing also happening. Uh, so one way to do it is to basically divide these uh, terms into almost equal pieces and minimize the interaction between them, because we want to make sure that queries that go to the same thing consistently go to the same um, uh, like, uh, server. So it turns, down, it turns out that the problem can be formalized as dividing this graph into pieces that have like in a, uh, equal weight of uh, terms. And whatever edge we have between clusters is like uh, uh, correspond to those queries that are divided into two pieces. So we want to minimize those type of edges. So, but that's a very hard problem. And how do we solve it? This is something that we have done as part of the graph mining library as a, 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 that I told you. Like we have applied this uh, library to, uh, let's say, 30 different applications across Google. This is the most interesting application in search. It was very impactful. I'll tell you at the end. How do we do balance partitioning? So first of all, balance partitioning itself is very hard. Uh, so why, why do I say even MP hard? Getting an appro uh, like a constant factor approximation not known. If you do semi-field program, you get the square root of log n approximation. Useless. So we want to solve it for a graph with uh, like billions of edges. How do we do that? So like we were tasked to do this. Like we wanted to develop a good graph mining library. This was one of the challenges we had. Uh, so what did we, did we do? We developed uh, an algorithm based on linear embedding of nodes of the graph into a line and then use that in a MapReduce framework. So these are the steps of the algorithm. There are like seven steps. It's like a multi-stage complicated applied algorithm, let's say. The first part of the algorithm is very interesting. We do a linear embedding of nodes. Uh, we make sure that nodes that are close to each other uh, end up uh, close to each other, uh, uh, like on the line as well, then that linear embedding will help us do different type of distributed optimization. So we want to decide what chunks of the edges to examine to local swaps. So that's how we decide. Like we, the linear embedding guides us to do like other type of distributed optimization later on. We can do a mean cut optimization on different type of boundaries. We can do even dynamic program and a small part of the uh, like boundary that we see that, OK, there is a big uh, cut. So what is the initial embedding? If we deal with geographs, we use uh, like Hilbert type embedding. If we, use a, if we work with a general graph like the one that we have in this application, we just uh, build a, uh, first we compute for each edge the effective resistance or something like that, the personalized page rank number between nodes. Uh, so th that would be the, edge of, uh, the weight of the edge. Then we build the hierarchical clustering of all nodes. And we can do it in a distributed manner very beautifully in one round of map, uh, in, sorry, like uh, the, the same number of map reduces as the uh, depth of the tree. So uh, like uh, the way we do it is simple, but uh, it's like similar to mean linkage uh, clustering. Then we look at the order of leaves in that tree, and that will be our linear ordering. And that's very, very effective. So I was given five minutes less than I thought, so I'm going to. Uh -huh. so really quick. Yeah? In your application, 
when you talk about the what's cached and which cluster, is the idea that you're looking for a cached search results for the entire query or cached partial searches based on some of the terms? So like each query will uh, correspond to a number of terms and like uh, the term, maybe some, some of those terms are cached in one replica and we, we determine like probabilistically which of those replicas we use for that query. Some queries are going to on, like, only alloc be allocated to one shard. But you you know, if, if you were caching only whole queries, you could just always map each query to the same place. No, no, we, we cache um, keywords. We, we, uh, because queries are going to be mapped to keywords and keywords are going to be uh, searched for in the index. Yeah, so that I had to be more clear there. So if I want to tell you how we evaluated these, we looked at several publicly available graphs. We looked at several um, previous work that tried to solve this problem on big data sets, distributed algorithms for this. One uh, by folks at Microsoft and one folks by folks at Facebook, Spinner, Matisse, uh, for a small uh, size graphs, and we show that our uh, basically algorithm, like our tool, uh, for, for example, if I want to find 20 clusters, uh, it uh, basically finds a cutoff size 27% of all edges, but the best known before for that graph is 37%. We, we uh, partition uh, the graph into 20 exactly equal pieces, but they did it for like with 5% error. So we beat the previous state of the art by a good percentage here and there. So we look at several examples and yeah. So this is one other story of applied algorithms there. So the main result of this part is we did uh, uh, save tw uh, like 25% of uh, cache misses like backend of search for whole search. This was a big deal uh, like three months ago. And yeah, like, so now we have a mandate to, to grow our like infrastructure optimization team. Yeah, that, so this was a, like one of the biggest improvements in uh, flash bandwidths, for example, for backend of search they had the past year. So the take home message for the second part is, yeah, like you can use uh, log information and blah, 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 and basically balance partitioning to improve uh, cache misses. And I have two and a half minutes. Uh, so the third part, the story is different. So the first part was an interesting algorithmic problem with some application. The second, second part was some applied algorithm. The third one is a longer story, uh, uh, especially in ads, but we are trying to apply the same ideas in like ba load balancing backend of search. Now we have a good relation with the search folks. Uh, so I can't tell you about the details of this, but I'll try to get to the message. Uh, so the idea here is that over time, we looked at different type of online bipartite matching problems where we have capacity constraint on one side and nodes on the other side arrive online. And we have to make decisions to allocate these nodes from one side to the other side and respecting the capacity or budget constraint on the other side. That's the type of problem that we have to solve. Uh, so the interesting thing is that there were several different types of algorithms. Some of them are good for worst case or adversarial models. Some of them are good for stochastic models. Stochastic models, you want to achieve some good approximation in expectation. The worst case models, we are like competitive ratio of online algorithm for the worst case scenario. So we knew that, okay, there are algorithms that achieve one minus one or approximation, primal dual base. Um, for the adversarial order. Um, and then uh, like for the stochastic part, instead of uh, finding these dual variables in an online manner, we had to solve some dual linear programs and we could achieve uh, like in theory asymptotically one minus epsilon competitive ratio in expectation. So uh, let me, okay. So but in practice what happened was that we are using a hybrid approach. We are using an approach that uh, is uh, like a combination of the adversarial model and the stochastic model. Because we wanted to be good against traffic spikes. The stochastic models make some forecasting assumptions. The um, adversarial models are too pessimistic. And uh, in reality, we want to deal with traffic spikes. So we use actually some sort of hybrid algorithm uh, that achieves on data also better than the best of uh, the 
uh, stochastic and primal dual algorithms. So the interesting part of uh, the story here is we wanted to develop some theory behind these like hybrid models. And we have managed to develop two theories. I can't tell you about those. I can give you uh, basically the final. Uh, so let me get to the message once to be able to summarize. So we have two models uh, for uh, this type of environment that we have an adversarial model and a stochastic model. So we either say we want to develop algorithms that achieve a good approximation factor uh, for adversarial model and a stochastic model at the same time. And it turns out that we have to, like not all uh, algorithms that are good in one model are good for the other model. So that's one way. And uh, it actually uh, shows why like, uh, the algorithms that we use in practice are working be better, because they are good for both scenarios. More recently, uh, this one should be EC 2015. Uh, more recently, we developed a model in which we say we measure how good of a forecast we have. And then we develop an algorithm that is aware of that uh, for accuracy of forecast. And we say, uh, basically, uh, like our algorithm, the approximation factor is a function of the accuracy of forecast. So like this is the curve that, for example, we can develop an algorithm that achieves this approximation factor, uh, the green curve, let's say. So we can show, OK, uh, like the more, uh, the better our forecast is, uh, our algorithm actually achieves the asymptotically optimum. But if the um, forecast is not good, if it's even like um, not good at all, we still achieve something reasonably well. Da -da -dum. So yeah, I, I, I wanted to give you three examples of algorithms in the field and uh, like optimization. Uh, so the first one was dynamic load balancing. And the message was use the linear probing with this additional capacity. The second one used uh, was like to use balance partitioning for the purpose of cache optimization. And the third one was to uh, develop online algorithms that are good both in the stochastic and adversarial models or a mixture of those type of models. Yeah, so I told you basically about this part, a little bit, a bit this part, and one example there. Thank you. Your, uh, your initial results on the, um, uh, the hashing and so forth were really cool, but you said, oh, well, it's great as long as epsilon's greater than one, you almost don't have to pay any kind of move cost. But in a real setting, what no one would ever waste like half their capacity. Um, with you, like, because that's why in the first slide I emphasized on uh, epsilon less than one result, which is for each one, we get at most one over epsilon square uh, uh, like moves, extra moves. And in simulations for the scenarios that they care about, it was like a constant. But so what we can prove for epsilon less than 1 is 1 over epsilon square at most. And that's not tight. We know you need to have 1 over epsilon. Uh, so there is a gap there. But the fact that we can bound the maximum, it could have been like linear even. We can bound it with a constant. So, but that's a valid point. The case that they care about is the epsilon less than 1, for sure. So your first result, uh, the assumption on the hash function is that every new input point is hashed uh, uniformly around the circle independent of what is happening before. Is that right? Uh, yes. Uh, so in other words, you order uh, balls from 1 to m, and then you hash them based on their ID and like a shared ha hash function, like or uh, basically uh, in that order. Uh, so like you have to be consistent in that. So like because linear probing is sensitive to the order, you have to also do it in the same order. That's also important. And like in their setting, it was so the the simplicity of the method is that they have already saved uh, these clients uh, basically uh, like um, data on different servers. They want to recompute a good hashing, which is consistent as much uh, like with minimum number of movements. And then they want to be able to recompute it even in a distributed manner. Uh, so like they can recompute the whole thing uh, like in all the servers as well. So that's the advantage. But in order to recompute the hash function, they have to do it from scratch. So that's why I emphasize 
recomputing the hash function it doesn't ma matter for them. Good, good. <laughs>